I'm going to uh, start Perceptron. So as I mentioned, I may bored some of you, but uh, it's necessary to be on the same page. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so Perceptron, as I mentioned in the first part of the lecture, <clears throat> is uh, just a linear method. So it's a simple linear classifier. So this simple linear classifier, if you want to show it by, I mean, graphically, uh, usually they show it this way. You know, there is a unit. In this unit, if you have x1 to xd, when x, I mean, vector of x, is a d-dimensional vector of x1 to xd. You know, by this I mean it's a vector, and these are scalars. So this is in uh, Rd. Okay. Uh, so perceptron. You can think of perceptron as having two parts. The first part of perceptron compute sigma of beta i x i. So basically there are some weights here for each of these nodes. And in the first word, we take summation of all of these nodes over all i plus beta null. So that's what's happening in, in the first half part of this perceptron. In the second part, we're going to apply a sine function to this. So basically, we are going to have sine of what has been generated in the first part. So the output of this perceptron is going to be either plus 1 or negative 1. So if you have two class problem and labels of one class is plus 1, labels of the other class is negative 1, Using perceptron, you can assign labels to these two classes. Okay. So uh, as I told you, it was not clear how to train perceptron at the beginning. You know, it took quite, I mean, when I explain it to you now, it sounds quite <coughs> trivial, but it took a couple of years for best researchers in the world to figure out how to train this perceptron, I mean, how to find this weights in a, in a correct way. So. Uh, it is, uh, I mean, the decision boundary is a line uh, in two-dimensional space. In d-dimensional space, it's like half a space. It's a hyperplane. So I can show it by beta transpose x plus beta null equal to 0. So this is the equation of this line or this hyperplane. Okay. So let me... Uh, look at the geometry of this hyperplane a little bit. You know, what we want to do is that we want to use this as decision boundary. In a sense that I want all positive points to be on one side of this decision boundary, all negative points be on the other side. And learning means that I choose beta, means I choose these weights, and beta null in a way that this line is in its correct position. You know, all positive points are one side, negative points are on the other side. So how should I choose these weights? You know, that's what learning perceptron means. It means learning these weights correctly, OK? So you know how we do learning. We usually define an objective function, and we are trying to, you know, we are, we are assuming a family of uh, you know, a family of uh, hypotheses here, our family is the family of linear discriminant functions. And in this family, we have to search for the best one. And search means that you have to define a cost function, an objective function, and try to minimize your error. 
So I need a notion of cost function here and I need notion of error. I have to define what do I mean by error, what do I mean by cost, and then I have to minimize it. So it's clear what do we mean by cost. You know, I want this, I want all positive points to one side, negative points with on the other side. So if I misclassify a point, uh, you know, I, I made a mistake and this is my error, you know, I have to minimize this. I have to minimize this mistake. I have to minimize misclassification. Okay. So let's look at the geometry of this uh, uh, line or this discrimination function. You know, if I take like two points here, there are two vectors. So for any x1 and x2, I can say that beta transpose x1 plus beta null is equal to zero, right? And I can say beta transpose x2 plus beta null is equal to zero. So that's true for any two points on this line, okay? So it means that beta transpose x1 minus x2 is equal to and plus, there's no plus actually, uh, beta transpose x1 minus x2 is equal to zero. Okay? So beta is a vector, and x1 minus x2 is also a vector. So x1 minus x2 is a vector, and beta is a vector. And if beta transpose, I mean, if dot product of two vectors is zero, what does it mean? Orthogonal. They are orthogonal, right? So it means that beta is orthogonal to the line, to x1 minus x2. <clears throat> so that's one conclusion that I can make. So another conclusion that I can make from just simple geometry and calculus is that for any x null, for any point on this point, Beta transpose x null plus beta null is equal to zero. And it means that uh, minus beta null or beta null actually is equal to negative beta transpose x null. Okay, that's the second conclusion that I want to make. Now, When I have this line, suppose that you know I, I'm giving a point x, and I would like to compute the distance of this point and uh, the, the line, decision bundle. I'm looking for this distance. So how can I compute this distance? I told you that beta is orthogonal to this line, right? So basically, I can say that beta is always orthogonal. So I can say, for example, I call this point x null. I can compute the distance between x and x null, and x null could be any point on this line, and then I can project it to beta. Then it's going to be my distance, right? So my distance basically of point x is beta transpose times x minus x null. Okay, that's my distance. For any point on one side 
it's going to be positive. For points on the other side, it's going to be negative. So technically, it's not distance. It's distance with a sign. You know, it could be positive or it could be negative. So the real sign is absolute value of this, OK? So this is basically beta transpose x plus, actually, minus beta transpose x null. But beta transpose x null, I know, is equal to beta null. OK? So this is basically beta transpose x plus beta null. So if you have x and you want to compute the distance between x and your decision boundary, simply you need to put that point in the equation. OK? And this gives you the distance between that point and the decision boundary, but uh, it could be positive or negative, so technically it's not distance. If you want to compute the real distance, it should be absolute value of this. Or in this scenario, that we have positive points on one side and negative points on the other side. So y, assume y is my labels. So here, you know, in the training, I assume that, you know, I have x i y i i equal 1 to n. And x is d dimension, and y i's comes from negative 1 and plus 1 set. Okay? So labels are either positive or negative. So I can either take absolute value of this, or I can multiply y i to this quantity. So if I'm on the positive side, beta transpose x plus beta null is positive. Plus 1 times plus 1, it's positive. If I'm on the negative side, beta transpose x plus beta null is negative. Times negative 1, it's going to be positive. So either way, <clears throat> it's going to be positive. So this is the distance of point i from the hyperplane. OK. So why did I compute the distance of a point from hyperplane? Get back to our original goal. You know, I'm going to train this line, and there are some points around that, and I want positive point be on the positive side, negative points be on the negative side. So suppose that some points are not on the, you know, these are positive points, these are negative points. That could be a perfect line, but suppose that I assign the weights in a way that it classifies points this way. Some points have been misclassified. So I would like to correct this, and to correct this, you know, I need as I said, a notion of cost function, and then I have to minimize it. You know, in many cases, especially in a neural network, we use gradient descent to minimize our cost function. Like in gradient descent, you have an objective function, and in this objective function, you just take the derivative of your error, and in each iteration, you take one step toward the you know minimum value. So I don't know how to get there. I just know the direction of error. I go one step at a time until I get, I can't improve more. So suppose that I want to do a gradient descent here. Do you have any suggestion of the cost function? You know, these are points that have been misclassified. So I have to define the goodness or badness of this line. You know, I have to somehow quantify how good or how bad is what I have found here, and then correct it. How do you define it? Yes? Sorry? No, first I want to quantify to see how good or how bad it is. You know, if I give you this line, and I also give you uh, 
this line, which one is better? The black one, why it's better? Sorry? The black one is better, but why? Because the number of misclassified points are less, right? So one way of quantifying the goodness of this line is to count the number of points that have been misclassified. But is it a good cost function? I want to minimize it. Sorry? It's not the best, but even if I want to use gradient descent, can I use this number of points? Can I start with that, but don't forget that I have to take derivative for gradient descent, right? Yeah, okay. So that was the reason that I computed this distance, because I'm going to define my cost function based on this distance. So base, yes. So that would be something similar to support vector machine. That was invented way after this, way after perceptron, that we put the line, somehow it has a good distance from both classes. But it, it invented years after that. Uh, OK, so I computed the distance because I want to define my cost function based on that. So there are some points that have been misclassified. I can define my cost function based on, the num based on the distance of points that have been misclassified. Distance to the decision boundary, okay? So basically, I can say uh, my error function, which is a function of beta and beta null, function of my parameters, is summation of distances of points that have been misclassified. So M set of all misclassified points. So I'm going to sum the distance of all points that have been misclassified, the distance of all points that have been misclassified to the decision boundary. If no points have been misclassified, this is zero. If a point has been misclassified based on how far Actually, and distance is a good thing, you know, just instead of just counting them, I know how far that point is from the boundary. If it's close, it's better than the case that it's pretty far. You know, means when it's pretty far, the, the decision boundary should rotate more to, to capture that point. When it's close, it should rotate less. So it gives me a good indication. Actually, I need a negative sign here as well. Do you know why? Sorry? So the error would be positive. Yeah, because you know I'm talking about misclassified points. You know, points are on the wrong side. You know, y i times this is the distance, because both of them are on the right side. You know, this is positive, this is positive, this is negative, this is negative. But when a point is misclassified, it's in the wrong side. It's positive, but the labels should be negative and vice versa. So I need the negative sign here to make sure that these are positive. Okay. So that's my error function. So having error function, it's easy to apply gradient descent. So the simplest thing that you can do is gradient descent. Just need to take derivative. And when you take derivative, you need to take one step toward the direction. So I need to take derivative of this error function with respect to beta. And the derivative of the error function with respect to beta is what?
What is it? So y i x i. Okay. And what about derivative of this function with respect to beta null? Just like m negative m forever. Okay. Okay, so I have derivative of my cost function with respect to my parameters. So how gradient descent work in general? So gradient descent is quite simple in general, you know. Uh, so if my parameters is W, for example, in gradient descent, I need to just update my W this way. Uh, or let me just write it this way. I need to know the derivative of error with respect to W means I need to know when I perturb W how my error will change and initialize the model with some initial value for W and see what the error is. Then take the derivative, go toward the negative direction of this derivative, one step. And this row shows the length of my step. The bigger it is, I take the larger steps. The smaller it is, I take the smaller step toward the error. So there's no guarantee that it goes to global mean if the function is non-convex. If it is convex, we go to global mean. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck in a local mean, right? So if con function is convex, that's fine. If the function is not convex, then I'm here. You know, I just realized that which direction should I take to minimize this. You know, I don't go up. I go down a little bit. And then I go down, I go down, I get here. So this is my derivative now. Okay, so because derivative at this point. So I don't move anymore. I stay here, but the mean is here. But that's how gradient descent works. We can't do better than this using gradient descent. Okay, so applying this gradient descent to our method I have beta that I need to optimize. And derivative is sigma yi xi. So it should be like yi xi over all m. There's a negative sign here. In practice, Usually people don't use the sigma. And do you know why? That's the same for beta null. So that's sigma over yi. So in fact, I should have this. But in practice, people just do this. I mean, in practice, what people usually do to train perceptron is to, given some data points, assign some random weights, feed those, one of those points, point one, to this perceptron. Then, so it's going to be a line that you can, according to this decision boundary, you can compute the error. Okay, an error is not zero, so you cannot classify points correctly. You can take derivative and update your weights. According to gradient descent, it's guaranteed that your weights is going to be better than the previous weights. Okay, and then you do this for the second point and the third point and up to the point and you go over and over and over up to the point that there is no error. And you can prove that if 
two sets are separable, linearly separable, this algorithm find a solution. Definitely, you know, find a solution which separate these two lines. If they are linearly separable, It's linearly separable means there is always a gamma such that uh, yi times beta transpose xi plus beta null is greater than equal gamma for all xi and yi. So if this is the case, if two sets are linearly separable, this algorithm definitely finds a decision boundary which perfectly separate these two. But it could have infinite number of solutions, it will find one of them. You know, if you have this set, there's infinite number of solutions. That's one solution, that's another one, that's another one, that's another one. And you're gonna find one of them based on the initial value, okay? So let's get back to this question. So why I don't use the sigma here? Why I uh, only use the error for one single point rather than the error over all misclassified points? Yes. Is that because you're getting a floating gradient? So it's like overcompensating? So you changed your decision value too much and then it's super wrong? Okay. Mm -hmm, exactly. So instead of gradient descent, you can use a stochastic gradient descent. And this is, if you use the sigma here, that would be gradient descent. If you don't use the sigma here, that's going to be stochastic gradient descent. We're going to see the details of stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent later on in this course. And there's also other variations like mini batch gradient descent. It's faster, it's an approximation. If you want to be completely correct, you have to put the sigma here. But computationally, it could be expensive when you have many points. If you have one million points here, in each iteration, you have to go through summation of one million points, which is quite expensive. So uh, you're gonna use this, a stochastic. And uh, so what's happening is that if you go through the sigma, then it gives you the correct direction, but you can show that stochastically, all, most of the time it gives you a good direction, you know? Yeah, it, it, it may happen that using only one point you go wrong for in one iteration, but overall you go to the right direction uh, generally, and it, it's way faster. Okay. Uh, so that's basically, Perceptron, yes. So when you're doing a, sto a stochastic gradient descent, are you doing it with the same point every single time or are you changing the points? What do you mean same points? You have a training set. You have to go to your training set over and over and over. Right, but like you're using like Y, X, I in this case. Like what if I just decide to choose like a different one? No, we go through all of the points that we have in training set. We go through all points in training set. But when you do a stochastic gradient descent, usually they shuffle the points in each uh, set. You know, we don't keep the order, you know, from X1 to Xn. You go in the second round, usually we don't go from X1 to Xn. We shuffle the points and oh, then okay. we go. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So basically you find your new point, or you find your new beta, and then uh, find it misclassified points from that then uh, do that, then randomly choose one from that point. Exactly, okay. yeah. Yes, I have, you know, I have this set of points, this training set, and I initial some random value for beta, and it turned out that it, I get this, okay? Then it's not a good one, I can compute my cost. My cost is that some points have been misclassified. This point is misclassified, so the distance of this point to line and the distance of this point to line, I add them up. This is my cost function. I want to make it smaller. So I take derivative, it tells me which direction of beta and beta null should I take to make it smaller. 
So I take one step and this one step make, for example, this line for me. And it, this is a smaller and I keep going until, you know, it gives me this. <coughs> so in each iteration, yes, I compute the error again and then I take derivative and so on. Uh, if, as I said, if it's linearly separable by this definition, using this algorithm, you're going to find a solution. If it's not linearly separable, I mean, so for example, if this is the case, there is no way to separate them by a linear decision boundary. Then you can get a decent solution, but in practice, you're going to see that it starts to, uh, you know, oscillate between two solutions. You know, it gets larger and smaller, larger and smaller. You have to stop there. And in finite number of iteration, you can prove that you can find solution, and this finite number depends on this gamma. The larger the gamma is, the number of iterations is less. The smaller the gamma is, the number of iterations more. Yes. Uh, is there an assumption that the coefficient vectors normalize? Coefficient vectors are sorry. Normalized, so why? Yes, yes. Otherwise, otherwise that wasn't. That was not the distance. So, that, so in the, in the case that you, really you do normalize it, yeah. Otherwise, you know, if it's not normalized, that's not the distance. If it's not normalized, you have to divide it by the norm of beta, right? Yeah, the assumption is that it's a unit vector. Okay, any other question? Yes. Sorry? Uh, could you explain uh, stochastic gradient descent and the use of gamma? That was two different things. Yeah. yeah. Stochastic gradient descent, which we go through the detail of a stochastic gradient descent later on in this lecture, means that instead of computing, you know, you have an objective function which can be written as summation of some parts. Okay? So your phi, say for example, phi is your objective function. And you can write phi as summation of phi i's, such that each phi i is error of one point, point x i. So in a stochastic gradient descent, instead of uh, subtracting learning rate times sigma phi i, you subtract learning rate times phi i. You get rid of the sigma. That's for computational reasons. Because it's going to be expensive to do, to go through all points when there are many data points. That's a stochastic gradient descent. So that was the definition of uh, linearly separable um, data. So the data is linearly separable. And it means that you can derive a line that's such that positive points on one side, negative points on the other. So sometimes you can't. Okay, this gamma tell you what's the gap, what is the margin between these two classes, you know, how far these two classes are from. If these two classes are well separated, gamma is large, with a small number of iteration, you can find the solution. If these two are pretty close, gamma is a small, you need very huge number of iteration to get the solution. It's pretty intuitive. Besides the mathematical proof, it's quite intuitive. Okay. Yes. So for the stochastic one, you just uh, uh, like choose one of the misclassified points randomly. Yes. Right. Yep. Okay. So perceptron, as I explained in the first part of the lecture, is building block of neural network. So the first model that people try to build out of this perceptron, especially after the fact, after this realization that perceptron is not a solution of artificial intelligence, cannot, uh, you know, there is a limitation uh, nature of this perceptron that cannot, for example, classify X or problem or solve XOR problems. So people start to put perceptrons together, different layers of perceptron. So basically, you know, we can assume that, you know, you have 
couple of these perceptrons. Okay? And then, you know, you have, again, a d-dimensional data point, and you feed all of these perceptrons with your points. Okay? And there are weights associated to each of these uh, edges. So I have different perceptrons here. And then I apply the sine function, I have output here. Then this output could be input of another layer of perceptron. So I put another layer of perceptron. And I feed them using the output of this. And I can have many layers of this form. And eventually, I can have one or more nodes as um, my output. You know, all of these, the output of these nodes can come to a perceptron and make my output. OK, people start to try this structure, and they call it multi-layer perceptrons or neural network. This is neuron, this is, I mean, perceptron is you know, uh, you know, a model of neuron, and this is a network of a neuron. So it's brain. That was the claim, actually, or a model of brain. Uh, so uh, this is called input. This is called output. This is input layer. And these are hidden layers. OK? So people will start to uh, put these different layers of perceptrons together. The problem was that they didn't know how to train. You know, we know how to train perceptron. I, I, by, by that time, we knew how to train perceptron because we were able to take derivative of the error with respect to weight. But here, I need to take derivative of this error. You know, suppose that I have y as correct in output, and this is what the network predicts. So I can define some sort of error, some cost function. And this cost function, which is a function of all of these weights, I have to have a way to take the derivative of this error with respect to each of these weights, because I want to correct those weights. And it was not clear how to do this until many different researchers in different places independently discovered backpropagation. So backpropagation is the main algorithm in feed-forward neural networks. This is called feed-forward neural networks. In feed-forward neural networks is the main algorithm to uh, train the model means to compute the correct weights. Okay. So now we want to go through the details of backpropagation. OK, uh, I think it's clear how it, this model works. You know, uh, you have an input. Here you have some weights and so on. So what, what you're going to see here, again, similar to simple perceptron, is a linear, I mean, weighted sum of all of these features. So it's like W transpose x. Here, actually, in perceptron, we used to have a sine function applied to this. So in, in neural network, we put a smooth function in of the sine uh, function here. We put like sigmoid function or tangent hyperbolic, you know, a smooth function. Because you would like to take derivative of this function and sine function, you know, doesn't have derivative. You can't take derivative of sine. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Yes. So that was one interpretation of neural network after uh, all, you know, that, you know, there was claimed that it's a model of brain and so on. But then some people 
basically realize that if it's a sigmoid function, you just, it's a, you know, some logistic regression on the top of each other. Yes, if it is sigmoid, it's, it's, it's a logistic regression. Okay, so you, you're going to have a smooth function here because we, you need to take derivative and this smooth function, uh, the most popular one is sigmoid. Some people use tangent hyperbolic. Recently, there are other functions that are more popular. We're going to see those functions, which is pretty recent. They're faster in training than sigmoid function and so on. Okay, but, uh, okay, so if this is going to be a weighted sum, then this nonlinear function is going to be applied, and we're going to have an output, and this output goes on and on. So we do need this nonlinear function. Otherwise, this model doesn't make any sense. Because if you think of this, you know, each layer is basically, you can write each layer as a matrix multiplication. So it's matrix W times X. It's another matrix times this and so on. So it's a linear operator, you know. And summation, I mean, if you have many of these linear operators, it's just a linear operator. If you don't have this nonlinear part here, just summation of some linear transformation is just a linear eventually. So everything collapses to a linear model. If you don't have that nonlinear sigmoid or tangent hyperplane or whatever function. Okay, so I'm going to uh, go through the detail of backpropagation. But the, the idea is that we start with some initial weights. This initial weights you can apply to the network and see what the error, the final error is. Now backpropagation uh, tell me how to compute the derivative of this error with respect to one of these weights. And if I do have using gradient descent or a stochastic gradient descent, I can update that particular weight and make it better for the next iteration. Okay, that's the idea. So we, we are talking about like feed forward neural network and it's back propagation. Okay. Uh, This is just a snapshot, a snapshot of, you know, a huge neural network. This is one node of one layer. So let's call this layer L. So in layer L, there is many nodes. I have just taken one of those. And then I have another layer of nodes. And this is one of those nodes. And I have another layer of nodes. And this is one of those nodes. So these are, suppose that these are, they have the three layers of uh, this network. And I call one layer L, one layer I, and one layer J. So these are perceptrons. So perceptrons, as I said, in the first half of the perceptron, we take summation of input, weighted summation of input. And the other side, we apply nonlinear function to it, OK? So this part, I would call it uh, A. And this part, I would call it Z. So this is AL, this is ZL, this is AI, this is ZI, and this is AJ, and this is ZJ. And uh, basically, you know, Z, L, for example, is going to be a nonlinear function applied to AL. Or this is for I, for J, for anything. Let me write it for I. Okay. And this nonlinear function 
could be many different functions. For example, it could be 1 over 1 plus e to the power of minus a for sigma of a, which is a function of this form between 0 and 1. Could be hyperplane, uh, hyperbolic uh, tangent, which is between negative 1 and 1 with similar shape. Okay? And uh, there are weights here. And A, for example, AI is summation of all of UIL times ZL over L. You know, each of these is just linear sum of uh, the previous step. Okay, now I have to define an error function and try to take derivative of that error function with respect to one of these weights. So, uh, error function could be different things, you know. So for the moment, and simplicity, let's assume that my output is only one unit. So I have one unit at the output, so it could be many. But let's assume it's one. So the output would be y hat. So let me, to be precise, let me tell you that my data point is, my training point is x i y i, and I have n of them. And uh, network. generate y hat. So I can have different cost functions. Let's, for simplicity, assume that my cost function is y minus y hat squared. OK? OK. Um, so I need to take derivative of this cost function with respect to one of the weights, say for example this weight. So I need to take derivative of my cost function with respect to u i l, for example. So back propagation is in fact application of chain rule. You know, we're just going to use chain rule many times. So derivative of error with respect to uh, UIL, I can write it as derivative of error with respect to uh, I want to take derivative of error with respect to UIL. Means I want to know if I perturb UIL a little bit, how much the, the, the final error will change. So I can write it as derivative of final error with respect to AI and derivative of AI with respect to the error. So how much this, the input of this unit is going to change times derivative of AI with respect to UI. Okay, what is derivative of AI with respect to UIL? AI with respect to UIL. Sorry? Good be Z L. Right. Because C AI is just sigma of L U I L. ZL. So if I just perturb, uh, you know, each of these AI is summation of all of these nodes times corresponding weight. So derivative of this with respect to this particular one is just ZL, right? So this is ZL. What 
What about derivative of error with respect to AI? Do I know this value? No, we don't know what the derivative of output with respect to AI is. So for the moment, I will just call it uh, delta I. Okay. So derivative of error with respect to AI, which is unknown for me. I apply chain rule again. I will write it as derivative of error. You know, I want to compute the derivative of final error with respect to AI. I write it as derivative of final error with respect to a layer which is closer, like AJ. times derivative of AJ with respect to AI. Actually, I need the summation here as well. Summation over J. You know, I'm taking derivative of error with respect to AI. So I wrote it as derivative of error with respect to AJ and AJ with respect to AI. But there are many of them. So if I want to see when I perturb AI, how the final error will change, basically I'm saying that it is how much AJ change, because AI will change AJ, right? But if I change AI, AI change all of these AJs. So I have to take the summation of all of these, right? So I have to go, I have to take summation over all units in layer J, okay. So derivative of error with respect to AJ, you know, I call derivative of error with respect to AI uh, sigma uh, delta I. I'm just call this delta J. Okay, so what about derivative of AJ with respect to AI? Uh, derivative of AJ with respect to AI, I can apply chain rule again. Okay. Do you have any suggestion? How, how can I write this? I can write it as derivative of AJ with respect to ZI and then derivative of ZI with respect to AI. So what is uh, derivative of AJ with respect to ZI? It's UJI. If I perturb ZJ, ZI, how does AJ will change, you know, UJ. So derivative of AJ with respect to ZI is just UJI. What about derivative of ZI with respect to AI? Derivative of this function, you know. I know what's the relation between A and Z. Z is just A that a nonlinear function has been applied to. That's the reason that we didn't use sine, because we, we wanted to take the derivative. So that's basically derivative of my nonlinear function, sigma that has been applied to A. Okay. Okay, I can put uh, all of these together now. Uh, You know, I have 
derivative of you know this delta i which is derivative of error with respect to ai is in fact summation over j of delta j times this quantity and this quantity is what is uji times a sigma prime ai okay and you know if you look at this one this has nothing to do with the index of the summation i can take it out so I can say that <coughs> delta i is sigma prime ai sigma over j delta j uji. This is i, this is j. So something interesting actually happened in this formula. There is a quantity delta which is not known to me. But I can compute delta i based on delta j. You know, if you tell me what the delta j is, I can tell you what delta i is. If you give me the delta of this layer, I will tell you the data of this layer, delta of this layer. If you tell me the delta of this layer, I will tell you the delta of this layer. Okay? So I can define delta is unknown. But I can define delta of one layer based on the delta of another layer. Okay, why it's useful? Because suppose that, you know, I have a fit for ordinary network and there's layers and layers and layers. At some point, I get to the last layer. Okay? Suppose that this is layer K and the output here is Y hat okay so what is what is Delta K by definition Delta K is the as derivative of error with respect to the weight right so I just make it very simple. The, the last layer, I mean, you can do it differently, but just to make it, I mean, clear. I assume that this perceptron is a special perceptron, doesn't have a sigmoid function here. You know, whatever comes in goes out, you know, just it's just summation. So in this case, basically, I have to take derivative of error with respect to y hat, you know? And I can take this derivative because my error function was y minus y hat squared. I can take this derivative with y hat. In fact, if it's a scalar, I don't need this norm, you know. So it's basically 2 times negative 2 times y minus y hat, you know, if it's pretend it's a scalar minus 2 y minus hat so I can compute delta for level k so if I can compute delta for level k I can compute the delta for one level before right and I can compute for la layer before k layer before k this layer this layer this layer so this delta will back propagate and knowing the last one, I can go up to the first one and find them. But if I know the delta, then I can find this error. Because derivative of error with respect to any weight is just delta i times zl. Right? So 
this is important formula and this is also important. So I can do something quite simple, you know, I can feed my network with some initial weights and then compute the error. Then I would like to know how should I change my weights. To know how should I change my weights, I can use gradient descent. To do gradient descent, I need to know the gradient of error with respect to each weight. Compute gradient of error with respect to each weight. I need this quantity and ZL. ZL is known because I feed the network forward. You know, I applied one data point with some initial values, take the sum, apply the nonlinear function to it. So I know what the ZL is. I know all of A's, all of Z's, all of this. Uh, you know, weights based on the initial value that I had. So ZL is a noun. I don't know the uh, delta, but it doesn't matter because I can compute the delta for the last layer and then I can backpropagate it and find it for other layers. And find it for other layers means that I can find this derivative for every single weight. You have this for every single weight means that you can correct that weight in the right direction. Okay. I will write down the backpropagation algorithm exactly, mm -hmm. but yes, you know, you're going to start with some initial weights, <coughs> randomly. And with initial weights, you're going to start randomly, but and you're going to uh, feed your network with one single data points and compute the error. Compute the error, you can compute all of this derivative mm -hmm. and correct the weight go for another data point, oh, okay. and so on, you know. But you have to do this many times. You have to go over all of your training point many right. times. Right. The same as perceptron, until it converges, you know, until you cannot make it better. But you can make it better, it doesn't mean that you have in global minima. It's pretty non-convex function, you are in a local minima. It was the common belief up to a couple of years ago, until very recently, it was a couple. Of, it was common belief that that's uh, a very uh, bad property of bad of back propagation that uh, leads to uh, you know a local minima. It turned out that some researchers now believe that. Uh, in high dimensional space, this local minima is not really bad. So there are many local minima that are as good as each other. You know, no matter which initial value you start, you get to a good solution. And you are in very high dimensional space. Uh, we don't really know, still we don't really know uh, many things about deep network, why it works, why it works so nicely many open questions in terms of, not, not technically in terms of the reason behind the success of these models. And this is also a sort of open question in terms of optimization that why it's a good solution. But it is apparently. Wouldn't it depend on the surface of the, of the, hyper, the hypersurface? Wouldn't it uh, depend on the structure of that function? Of course, it depends on the shape of this cost function. Yeah. Definitely, it depends on that. You know, if you look at the literature of uh, neural network, early literatures, you know, there are papers about how to choose um, cost function right. such that, uh, you know, the number of local minima is, min is minimum, or we don't have that, it's convex. 
or there is uh, many literature around how many local minima we are going to have, the number or order of exponential and so on and so forth. It was, as, as I showed you in even 2006, one of the claim of uh, one of the inventors of backpropagation about the limitation of backpropagation was that it uh, trap in poor local minima. With in general, it's just true, but apparently in high dimensional space, this local minima is not poor usually. It's, it's, not, it's a decent solution. Right. Or we haven't really found out better algorithms to have better Well, there are many algorithms, but it's still one of the dominant algorithms for training is backpropagation. So when you say like uh, high dimensional space, does it mean like projecting the data in some Space, like. No, not, not necessarily. You have d dimensional data points. Oh, you mean like just the high yes. dimension? Yes. Okay. High dimension. I mean, the data is high dimension. Most of the data that we are working with are high dimensional data, mm -hmm. right? We are working with images. Mm -hmm. And images is taken by a camera with six megapixel, you know? Mm -hmm. so how many measurements do you have? It's a vector of this length. Right. So it's pretty high dimension same as text and so on. So our data is very high dimensional data. And apparently in this space, it doesn't matter. Okay. Any, any question? Okay, so, uh, so if I want to summarize backpropagation algorithm for you, it works this way. Uh, so in uh, step one, so choose some random weights, then apply x to the neural network and compute y hat, then compute delta k for output, which is simply in this case minus 2 y k hat minus y k. Then compute each uh, delta i, which is equal to sigma a i sigma over j delta j u j k. Then compute. <clears throat> this derivative, derivative of error with respect to uh, the weight as delta i z l for all weights. So when you have this, then you can compute this now. This is basically plain backpropagation algorithm. As uh, one uh, implementation note about backpropagation is that when you want to initialize weight for the network, 
it's better to use weights close to zero, I mean, small weights, weights that are close to zero. Um, when weights are large, the model can overfit. I believe that you are familiar with the concept of overfitting and underfitting from previous courses, but overfitting is a real, a real threat in any type of learning, right? You can, when you have a flexible model, you can torture the model at a level that it learns all details of your training set. It's quite bad. You cannot generalize, you know. If you teach someone all details about, you know, you want to tell someone that what's the difference between uh, a person and a tree. Simply, you can say, you know, you can distinguish this by one feature. You can say, okay, usually people are not more than two meters, usually, and usually trees are more than two meters. That would be sufficient to distinguish between 90%. I mean, you get 90% accuracy in your test set. But if you go to too many details, this is my training set, and I start to say that, okay, uh, this is, their height is either 175 or 170 or 172 or this and that. And the, the color of their shirt is either red or orange. And, and the type of their shoes is either this or that. And the type of their hair. And all details of trees, and it, you can't generalize. You know, if I show you a new person which was not in this class and doesn't have this type of shirt and this color and this uh, height, you can't f realize that it's a person, you know, the same as three. So you, you overfit your model. So you shouldn't give too much details to the model. So model, each model has a flexibility, you know, capacity, complexity. If the model is too complex, it means too, too flexible, like neural networks are. So a threat is that you can overfit the model. And overfitting can happen with large weights. For the reason that, you know, this is the sigmoid function or uh, tangent hyperbolic and, you know, close to zero, the behavior of this function is almost linear. When you are far from zero, the behavior becomes nonlinear. So large weights could lead to overfitting because the, the model starts to behave quite nonlinearly. So it's very flexible. Small weights can collapse the whole model to a linear model, so it restricts its capacity or flexibility. So start with a small weights uh, for, for, for initial values. One way to avoid overfitting that I will tell you more about it is weight decay. You, you know, we can add one term to this to, to make sure that weights doesn't get too large and the model doesn't overfit. One of the problems with uh, neural network in the past was that we didn't have enough data points and overfitting was common in, in neural network. Now we have too many, too, much, too many data points to feed and it doesn't happen quite often. Uh, yeah, the, I wanted to mention this, that the, you know, the, the plain uh, back propagation that was, was a common belief that cannot be applied to deep networks I mean, we can apply it to deep networks now. I mean, now we learned that it can be applied to deep networks, and there are many deep networks methods now that just use plain backpropagation for training. Okay, any question? Yes, I mean, you know, RBM was, RBM is, stands for Restricted Boltzmann Machine. RBM was, which we go through RBM later on, you know, that was the idea of RBM in 2006 paper was that, uh, you know, you have, suppose that you have a deep network. So there are many layers. So you can do back propagation. How can I do this? How can I train this? The, uh, the idea was that, okay, let's train this layer by layer. I'm going to train these two layers. And that's these two layers, and then these two layers, and then these two layers. But what does it mean that I want to train these two layers? If I have a supervised problem, this is my input, and my output, say, is y. So what should I use here as my 
um, you know, true value, you know. What does it mean that I want to train these two layers together? So the training here could be unsupervised. And that's where restricted Boltzmann machine comes to play. So in the first papers or the first attempts of deep network, these layers are restricted Boltzmann machine, which we will teach in this course, that what restricted Boltzmann machine are. And a restricted Boltzmann machine, actually, when you have this, I mean, roughly I can say that, okay, I have a representation of the D in D-dimensional space, and this is D prime. What is the best representation of the data in D prime dimensional space uh, for this D dimensional representation? So I have a notion of energy that I want to minimize. Which representation minimizes this energy? You know, suppose that you have other, you have seen other type of unsupervised learning, PCA. It's unsupervised. I give you X in D dimensional space and you give me some representation of the data in another space. Exactly the same thing. It's another representation of the data is another space. Then give this, go for another representation and so on up to the last stage. Last stage, I put my output here. And I train my last stage with the real output. Then I use this initial weights and then I do some sort of fine tuning with an algorithm similar to backpropagation to correct them, okay? Because if you want, I mean, that was the belief that if you want to go with backpropagation from the first place, when you have many of these, uh, this derivative of error will be negligible after a couple of layers, after two layers. And Basically, you can't compute it. You know, the derivative of the gradient would, you can't trust this derivative of gradient because it's almost negligible. So it tells you that you have to go this, it's pretty dangerous problem. You know, you don't, you know, there are two problems, uh, vanishing gradient and exploding gradient. Exploding gradient is better because you realize that the program broke and it's not working, you know, you have to, there is a bug here. But vanishing gradient is pretty dangerous. You even don't realize that what's happening. You know, just the direction is wrong. And you just go on and on and on and it doesn't converge. You know, and you don't know what's happening. That was the problem. But then and there are solutions for that now. And there are methods that use plain back propagation to, to train this. So, I mean, it's comparable to... Uh, restricted Boltzmann machine, I can say that most new methods don't use restricted Boltzmann machine. Most of them don't use restricted Boltzmann machine anymore. It's just plain backpropagation or convolutional network or RNN. These are the three most common ones. Up to a couple of years ago, the most common one was restricted Boltzmann machine. It's not anymore. Okay, any, any question? Any other question? Yes, backpropagation is the name of the algorithm for training. Okay. Fit forward is the name of this structure. Okay. This structure of network is called fit forward network. Because there are other structures, like convolutional network has different structure. Or RNN has different structure. It's not fit forward. There's loops from one layer to the previous layer, for example. It doesn't go just forward. That's the name of the structure, but uh, so let me quickly tell you about the stochastic gradient descent and uh, gradient descent that we talked about, you know, as I mentioned, you may have a cost function in this form. This phi can be written as a summation of phi i's such that usually each phi i associated to one data point, to data point i. There's some cost function that you can write it this way. If you have this type of cost function, then you can use gradient, uh, you can use um, uh, a stochastic gradient descent. Gradient descent, I mean plain gradient descent or batch gradient descent has this form of update. You update W by W minus the learning rate times the gradient of your cost function with respect to your parameter. 
Okay. And because of the nature of this function, which is summation of some other function, it's W minus uh, learning rate or a step size times this summation. When you have many data points, computing this summation could be quite expensive in each iteration. You have millions of data points and you have to go through all of them for each iteration. Yes? How do you choose the good learning rate? Uh, by difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, in general, you can um, use cross-validation, for example, to go for a good uh, learning rate. Uh, in practice, there are many tricks like uh, the learning rate, which depends on uh, the number of iterations. So you start with a large learning rate. I'm going to mention that here. You start with a large learning rate, but in each iteration, you're going to make it more sm uh, smaller. Because, you know, if you have a small learning rate, it means that in each iteration, you're going to take a very small step, right? It takes forever to get to the mean. But if you have large learning rate, what's wrong with large, what's what, what, what going to happen? What's, what can go wrong? Yes? Well, you go over, to, uh, over where you want to go. Go over the minimum, yeah, just go to F. Around yeah, you, you may overshoot, actually. You know, it, this, is, this is my uh, function that I want to minimize, and I'm here. The learning rate, you know, I take a big step, it take me here. And the next step takes me here. And the next step takes me here. Next step takes me here. So it doesn't converge, you know. So it should be as small to make sure it, it, it does converge. But if it's too small, it takes forever to converge. So one strategy is to start with the large one. But in each iteration, you make it smaller and smaller. And uh, in general, you can apply uh, cross-validation to find a good one. Uh, the, unfortunately, there are, in, in the area of neural network, there are many tricks involved in training and optimization, you know. So sometimes you feel that there is, I mean, the, the person who wants to train it needs to have magic hand to, uh, you know, to do this. It's not quite, I mean, when you have a convex function, like if you have support vector machine, it's quite clear what's happening. It's quite clear what the minimum is, how to optimize it. But uh, neural network, you know, you need to have lots of experience how to design it, how to put the structure, how to train it, how to choose the initial value, how to choose, uh, you know, the step, learning rate, and so on. Yes. Mm -hmm. as, I, as I mentioned, you know, uh, uh, optimization is quite uh, a large open problem in the era of neural network and people look at all type of uh, uh, optimization way like Hessian free, line search, you know, many, many different things. But as a dominant method, I'm not sure, actually. But yeah, optimization is quite a large area. OK. Um, so here, actually, uh, you know, you can, this is basically plain uh, gradient descent or batch gradient descent. But um, a stochastic gradient descent in a stochastic gradient descent, you consider only a subset, you know, it's called SGD. You consider only a subset of uh, this summation, you know. You have this summation here. And instead of everything, you consider a subset of that. It's called uh, a stochastic gradient descent and could be quite efficient. So uh, usually people get rid of this summation and go only for one data point, as we did here for neural network and we did for perceptron. Or you can use, uh, you know, that, that would be basically the 
simple algorithm for stochastic gradient descent that you choose your initial value and you repeat until converges randomly shuffle data points in the training set and then you compute this you know you don't have the sigma here you don't have the correct gradient you just have the gradient according to one data point this is uh, some, and one example here that I will post it. You can look at this example later on. And you have batch gradient descent, and in batch gradient descent, instead of looking at the summation of all of these n data points, you're going to look at summation of b data points. When b is a subset of n. And then this b could be a parameter of this uh, method. It's usually called mini batch gradient descent. And here is the algorithm for mini batch that you choose your initial value and then you choose B and then you repeat until converges again randomly shuffle data points in the training set and then you know you go if it's 10 you go over from 1 to 11 to 21 and so on each time you have a subset of 10 data points um, sometimes it works better but using only one is the most common one okay as I mentioned you know this learning rate you can choose it uh, adaptively it could depends on iteration you know T is number of your iteration so uh, that's a common practice so you start with a large value but each time it's going to be, you know, this constant times plus t plus, you know, another constant. And t get increased, you know, in your iteration. In, in, in each iteration, you make it better, definitely, right? So the longer that you run it, you're closer to the mean. So when you're closer to the mean, you make it a smaller to make sure that you don't overshoot and you don't miss the, the, the mean. So it's uh, basically they, they just use this. Uh, okay, any question here? This argument is correct not only for convex function. You know, if you have a non convex function, again, this is correct. You know, I want to get here. Right. I shouldn't overshoot here, you know. Right. And close to this, I have to fine tune and start to right, so go small. My question was uh, more, to, uh, more about going to the global minima rather than mm -hmm. getting stuck in the. There are many, there are many techniques in general, you know, in optimiz for optimization of non-convex function. In practice, uh, as I said, in high dimensional space, you know, you don't need to do that because all of these local minima are al almost as good as each other. So they are good. I uh, was told that uh, 17 more people registered in the course in, during the break. Um, so I don't know how many people, I'm going to look at this and I don't know how many people are going to uh, register in the course eventually. But uh, soon you're gonna see a list of papers for presentation based on the number of people we, have, we need in a schedule how to present papers for the second part of the course and how to choose uh, uh, projects. I'm going to let you know soon. Any qu if there is no question, I will just finish. Have a good weekend.